Okay, I don't want to. Okay, I. Yeah, I got it here. Okay, oh, great. Maybe I can. Okay, you can start. <clears throat> great. Okay. We'll just wait for. Um, I can sort of see the participant number here. So as soon as that number starts to rise, I'll we'll we'll get going. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, I have you live okay. on YouTube now. Yeah, I got Thanks, it. Thanks, Katie. Here. Okay, and great. I'm going to broadcast okay. the meeting. Okay. Okay, you can start. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll just wait for. Um, I can sort of see the participant number here. So as soon as. Okay. Just a second. <clears throat> Margaret. Good morning to everyone who's joining us. We'll get started in just a moment. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us so early on this Friday morning. On behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to this conversation on Julian of Norwich with Amy Frickholm and Marcy Stockman. We're so grateful to be able to gather with all of you during this time of separation. A recording of today's presentation will be available later on to share with anyone who couldn't join us. We're streaming on YouTube Live now as well. And we'll also let you know how to get a copy of Amy's book on Julian and where to find more information about the well-read moms and Marcy's book too. So by way of introduction, Amy Frickholm is a senior editor and award-winning writer for the Christian Century, where she writes on religion, culture, and spirituality. She started her career in academia, earning a PhD in literature from Duke University. She has received grants from the Louisville Institute, the Fulbright Scholar Program, and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation for her work. Her newest as yet unpublished manuscript is about the late ancient desert mother, Mary of Egypt. And Marcy Stockman is founder and president of the international movement and book club, The Well-Read Mom. With a passion for reading and motherhood, she writes and speaks to encourage women. Through the power of reading together and reading well, well-read moms across the country are finding friendships, meaning, and true leisure connecting on a deeper level and serving others in their search for purpose is Marcy's passion. And she is also the author of The Well-Read Mom, Read More, Read Well. Thank you so much for joining us today, Amy and Marcy. Thanks for having us. It's great to be here. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Paraclete Press. I love your work and all you're doing. Thank so you. I'm gonna interview you, Amy. I'm, I'm really excited to find out about your book. Why, first of all, why did you write about Julian of Nor Norwich? Yeah, I, um, it, for me, it started a really, it started about 20 years ago and I was um, a young graduate student and I really, really wanted to get pregnant, <laughs> which I suppose isn't true of every graduate student, but I really wanted to uh, get pregnant and I couldn't. And I was really struggling with that on a deeply personal level. And I decided that I needed some time um, away from like my ordinary life to just figure out what to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went on a retreat. I was not a religious person at that time. And I, I didn't really know what a retreat was. And I just figured I should bring a notebook and a pen. And I got to the retreat center and I just kind of had the day, paid them $20 and let, they let me wander around for the day. And I got scared. And um, I decided to just grab a book off the shelf because the only thing I know how to do when I get scared is read. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was in the library of the retreat center. So I just really randomly picked a book off the shelf. And that book was uh, Meditations with Julian of Norwich. I didn't know who Julian was. I knew she was a medieval woman. You know, I was a PhD in literature. So I knew like books and I, I knew she was a medieval woman. I knew she'd written something. Um, that was about all I had. And I took that with me out into the garden. And um, it was life changing was life-changing. So I had so many questions after reading that and after really engaging my own personal story in that book that I just started to research and explore. And that's how I, I started. Well, I want to get back into your story and how it was life-changing. But first, give us, give us a brief intro into Julian. Uh, who was she? 
why are we, you know, why would we read her today? So I think the most important thing to know is that she's the first woman to write a book in English that we know of. Well, of course, there could have been other books and we just lost them, but she's the first one. And she wrote around the same time as Chaucer in late 14th century. So um, I think that, you know, her being the first, she's a pretty good candidate for the first woman to have written a book in English. Uh, and um, her book was a series of showings. So she got very, very ill at a certain point in her life. And then she saw what she called 16 showings of the love of God. So um, deeply embedded in her work is this idea that the love of God is everywhere in everything and for everyone. And she spent the rest of her life, I think, meditating on those visions and then writing the there's two there are two versions of the book a short version and a long version and um so she spent the rest of her life meditating and 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 trying to understand the visions that she had seen and then writing them down um and she lived at a certain point in her life she went into what was known as an anchorage so it's a little house attached to a church or in a churchyard where a lot, where women very often women it could also be men but very often women went to dedicate their lives to praying for the people of the church. So um, she was uh, she was well known in her area for her work with prayer. And also as a kind of almost what we would call today, maybe like a therapist because people would come to her with their difficulties, with their struggles, with their pain, and she would speak with them um, in maybe the way that a spiritual director would today or a therapist. Okay, so, so to put this in context, because we're all quarantined, right? We're in our homes, most of us, unless you're out on the front lines and thank you for all who are. But so we, we're kind of similar with Julian in a certain way right now, being called to live our circumstances right where we are. And you mentioned it, she was an anchorite. Can you fill us in on what an anchorite, what that meant in yeah. those days? It was a really specific thing. I mean, the term itself goes way back in Christianity to people who went out into the desert and live solitary lives. But in the 14th century, it was a thing that really developed on the east coast of England. And uh, it was, so there were, I can't remember the exact number of known anchorites, um, but they were people, uh, women and men, who would go and to live a solitary life, confined in a cell of some kind. So often it could be something that was attached to the church building, and sometimes it was something in the churchyard, but they would go there for the specific purpose of praying constantly for the people of that parish. So it was a real intimate relationship between the parish, whatever that was, and, and the anchorite, um, a real intimate relationship between those two. It was a church position. And often during that time, one thing I discovered in my research that I thought was so interesting was that often at that time, priests were moved pretty rapidly through parishes, um, but anchorites didn't move. So they would really drill down in a specific location with a specific people and, and minister to those people in all kinds of ways, the first way being prayer. So they would um, commit themselves to a life of prayer for that specific church and that specific people. So you think of anchorite. At first, I thought it was an she was a nun, but that's that's not her background, is it? An anchorite is just praying for the parish. She wasn't a nun. Was she, was she married? Or? We don't know any of those things. She might have been a nun who then chose to go into the anchorage, and then she also might have been um, a married person who lost her husband. There were so many men dying in those days from um, war and disease. Um, and they were often they would often leave their families and go away for very long periods of time. So we really don't know. She never mentions either. She never mentions either a um, a home um, monastery or convent. And she also never ma men mentions a family. Um, she mentions her mother. That's the only person we know of that she was in relation with uh, at the time when she had her illness. So so we really don't know that question. And, and scholars have gone different ways. Um, for me. What makes most sense is that she was a woman who suffered very deeply in the plague. So there were two enormous plagues that ravaged Norwich during her lifetime. One was when she was a child and one when she was a young woman who would have been about the age of a mother. So it's very possible. And I think it makes deep sense that the intense loss that she experienced was the motivating factor 
that led her to search for meaning and for love um, through the writing that she undertook. And I think that whether or not she was a mother and lost her children, because the second plague that ravaged Norwich in the late ninth in the late 14th century was one that took, I think three out of every four children. So it was, whether it was her own children or just the loss of an entire generation of children, that suffering, that pain is, is written through her writing. And I think serves as the most likely motivation for her to become the first woman to write a book in English. Cause you'd have to have something pretty powerful and pretty deep to break convention and go off in this direction. And I, for me, as I studied her life, that makes the most sense. So isn't it interesting, Amy, that you, you wrote a book on Julian of Norwich and we're discussing it today when everyone in the world is affected by a pandemic. Yeah. Um, you and enclosure has been kind of our answer, right? Like we're enclosing ourselves in a way and enclosure was her method of, of work, of ministry of life. So you mentioned that she had a tremendous amount of pain and loss, and yet in her writing, there's a tremendous amount of hope. So how does she the paradox of loss, suffering with uh, this message that all shall be well? Yeah, yeah, she goes, I think she really goes very, very deep into the question of suffering to find the answer. So I think sometimes we can use her words, all will be well, all will be well, as a kind of ignoring of the deep suffering or pain of life. But for her, that was never the case. For her, it was going way deep down into that suffering and really reckoning with it and then seeing in it hope and seeing in it love and seeing in it over time, a time she couldn't even understand resolution and, um, and meaning. So she sort of transcends it. She doesn't deny it. No, she doesn't deny it at all. In fact, it, she uses a lot of these images of compost in her, in her writing. So one of the things I think that helps us understand is like this idea that, that God somehow takes all of the yucky, messy, rotten, painful suffering of life and composts it for us to create new beginnings, to create new realities, to teach us things. I was recently reading Richard Rohr's book, The Universal Christ, and he says God has basically two ways of communicating with us, and one is suffering and one is love. And I think in her work, you can see those two languages finding each other and creating this, this beautiful work. Wow. Wow, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited actually to read your book and then to go back and, and read Julian's words again. Um, can you tell us some of your favorite uh, passages by Julian? Man, when I encountered Julian, I started memorizing pieces of it because I just needed them that badly. Um, and so I still to this day walk around saying certain things that um, that I can't, that have become so much a part of my life. They're like, they've become organic to my own life. So um, I say to myself a lot, um, the soul must perform two duties. The first is to always wonder and be surprised. Mm -hmm. And the second is to let go and let be, always finding pleasure in God. And what I love about this passage is that it takes this whole idea of religious duty or obligation and transforms it into beauty and delight. So the soul must perform two duties. What are those two duties? Experience pleasure, experience delight, um, and wonder and be surprised. That's what, that's what we do. That's, that's our job as, as souls on this earth. And I just think that's a wonderful transformation of, of this idea of obligation or, or religious duty. How would a woman that you might be speaking to right now that's at home with really a lot of responsibilities coming her way in a new way, you know, cooking for everyone all the time and food and washing off food before it even comes in and all these new responsibilities and no real outlets that we're, we're used to. Um, what, what can we learn during that time or how could, how could she help us live that duty of the soul, the two duties? I think it's um, probably, I mean, my guess would be something like really looking at the fine grain details of life 
not escaping them. It's not about forgetting or, or getting beyond them or somehow understanding that it's, you know, if I could just have more, I mean, I'm very guilty of this, but like, if I could just have more time to myself, then I could really get it. I think for her, it's what really drew me to her work in the first place was this deep and intimate connection between body and spirit. And so the embodied life is the place where we look for delight, where we look for surprise. So her, her, her word to a contemporary woman who's just struggling with how do I make sense of this new world might be to always wonder and be surprised. The question itself is of deep value and to look around and see what, what, is, what are the surprises available here and what are the strange, maybe unusual delights available even in this suffering, even in this time of uncertainty and, and, and struggle. Right. Okay. So not, not to escape or run away from our circumstances, but within, yeah. within it, ask, ask and, yeah. and, and trust that, trust. that it's available, which I mean, is so much easier said than done. <laughs> and she would definitely know that. Uh, uh, Julian talked about the wrath of God in a way we're not, she didn't, she didn't believe in the wrath of God, or can you speak about that? She, I think I grew up thinking a lot of time, having a lot of guilt, thinking that God was mad at me because I was doing things wrong. Um, she doesn't speak that language about God. Can you talk about that a bit? She definitely does not speak that language about God, but she's aware of it. She knows that the people around her know that language and are intimately uh, acquainted with it and probably have that narrative. And so she doesn't, and this was one of my questions about her when I was first exploring is what is her relationship really with the church? Is she a protester? Is she, uh, you know, a, a servant? Is she, I, I, I just couldn't understand what is an anchorite's relationship to the bigger, you know, the hierarchy and so on. And what she says about the wrath of God is that in her visions, it was never shown to her. She said, wrath is in us. We are the wrathful ones but she never saw it in God. And so she saw, I think that wrath and love are not compatible, but we're the ones who project our wrath onto God and then say that God is wrathful. And she said, that's just fundamentally wrong. God is love and love is the meaning of all things. Like what about Jesus in the temple when he, we see sort of righteous anger? Yeah. I, she doesn't ever talk about that. Um, I think wrath and righteous anger would probably be two really distinct things. Um, wrath is this idea that God is mad at Marcy for being alive and for having to walk in this difficult, you know, <laughs> having to walk this difficult path that we all call life, right? And that, that God's already mad at you. And you, you didn't even do, you haven't even done anything yet. <laughs> That's wrath, I yeah. think. Righteous anger might be this thing that bubbles up from the circumstances of life when they are unjust and wrong and, and that compel us to speak. Because I'm guessing that even Jesus loved the people that he, uh, whose, whose tables he overthrew, right? Mm -hmm. he, he loved them and he was giving them freedom. You know, let's get rid of this stuff that's untrue and let's free the things that are true. Oh, that's a beautiful distinction. So her view, her narrative then becomes that God delights in her? Would yes, you absolutely. Delights in her. And that it's her job actually to delight in herself. That, that she, that's, that's one of the duties, you know, that, that she delights in this, in this particular human life that she's been given to live. Wherever she is. Yeah, wherever she is. And the word delight, I mean, it just comes up over and over and over again in her work. It, it's, you know, it has all kinds of different nuances and, and different ways of talking about it. But the word delight is, you know, it, it, it's the center. Mm. So we need to be, pay more attention to God, God's delight of it. What if you don't feel that delight? Like, what can we do to experience more? of? I wonder, I mean, always wonder and be surprised, I guess, look around, you know, and pay attention. I love, I, another part I love is at the end of it, of the book where it almost sounds like God is a little bit annoyed with her because um, th this is how I read it. I mean, it's the very last chapter and um, it says, after 15 years and more, I was answered in my spiritual understanding. Would you know 
the Lord's meaning in this thing. Be well aware. Love was his meaning. Mm -hmm. Who showed it to you? Love. What did he show you? Love. Why did he show it to you? For love. Mm -hmm. I love that part because it almost sounds like God is a little bit annoyed. Like 15 years, my dear, I have been showing you love. And you keep asking, who's showing me this? Why are you showing me this? What's the meaning of this? And the answer is always love, 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 love. But sometimes uh, she also talks about blindness. Yeah. And so we have this blindness to God delighting in us, to God's love for us, even though as we're entering now Holy Week, what a profound time to experience or to walk through these days of the, yeah. of the um, aware of this, what, what we're living, what we're offering in our days and, and his love for us on the cross. But can you speak about um, the blindness she talks about? Uh, yeah, she talks about how humans are always seeing and not seeing at the same time and mm -hmm. how our lives are this crazy mix of, she calls it well and woe. And well and woe are always woven together. So she'll often talk about how God's will is that we see and we don't see. And, and that those things are not, um, that that is being alive. Knowing and not knowing, seeing and not seeing. Um, and so I think she asks us to walk this careful path between awareness and the letting go of um, trying to to know and see everything. We can't, we are, we're limited humans. I think one place we see that is when she talks about, for example, that the church is the ceiling and then there's the sky, yeah. right? And sometimes all we see, we can see is the ceiling, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a sky. And so she struggles with the question of like, when I see the ceiling, am I seeing what's true? Only, only partially. What, there's a bigger reality that isn't available at all times. And, and she's encouraging us to hold that tension. That's right. Of seeing right. and not like, it's kind of like uh, whatever saint prayed, no, I believe, help my unbelief. Exactly. It's very much like that. And, and even seeing unbelief as, a, as something, just another thing to delight in, right? To, to recognize as part of letting go. I, I don't always, I was going to see if I could find the, um, find, find quickly the passage about, uh, about well and woe and seeing and not seeing, but I'm not sure I can find it that fast, but I'm happy so, to. You know, just, just talking with you, Amy, it's, it's the, there's the real message that's brought home with Julian is, is God's delight in us and that we receive, learn to receive. She talks about wanting, being one with. Yes. I love that word. Can you unpack that for us a bit? Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. And I think kind of deeply mystical and I, and, um, but her, her verb is one. So just like Marcy said, like it's one. <laughs> so it's, it's a verb that she invented. Basically, she decided to use the concept of one into a verb. So she, she talks about this oneing that, that happens between humans and God. And then she talks about how she tries to put it in all kinds of different metaphors. So one is that God is in us we are also in God. Um, sometimes I, one time when I was reading Julian, I all of a sudden thought, oh my gosh, she's talking about knitting. Because certainly women had lots of handicrafts, you know, that they would sit and do all the time. And knitting was one of them. And she probably spent a good amount of time knitting in the anchorage, I'm guessing. And at mm -hmm. one point, one of her metaphors just sounds like she, when we talk about wanting, she's talking about, she's using the metaphor of knitting. Because when we knit, we bring things together into one. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think knitting, clothing, she often talks about how we wear God and God wears us, or our clothing, we are wrapped in God and God is wrapped in us. Mm -hmm. So she uses a lot of those kinds of metaphors, um, mm -hmm. often very intimate, very female, very, um, very domestic images. Mm -hmm. um, for God and how, how it is that we manage to be one with God or how God is doing this oneing work with us. Wow. That's beautiful. I, I think, can you speak more about, she's the first woman to write a book in the English language that we know. Of. What, 
what are more of the uh, particular feminine things she brings into her writing that is different from the writing before that? Yeah, I mean, so certainly a lot of this domesticity, this domestic metaphors of texture, fabric, um, knitting, yarn, um, those kinds of, she was definitely aware, and Norwich was a big textile production place. I mean, so in the 14th century, there was a lot of production. They they had a lot of sheep. They turned those sheep into fabrics. She lived close to places where um, fabric was being produced. So I think she was very aware of that. Um, and certainly those were metaphors that I, I mean, I personally haven't seen anywhere else in, in uh, medieval literature. So that was the case. She's also really, like really body images. She has this whole famous passage about, about um, going to the bathroom and how beautiful it is that we fill up with something and then we release it and then we fill up with it again. I, I just, I, I've read quite a bit of medieval literature. I've never seen anybody else like go to that level of embodied, intimate, um, what is what does it mean to really be a body? Um, mm -hmm. And then she does this amazing, amazing work on the motherhood of God um, and how God is our mother. She's a very famous passage where she says, God is our father and God is our mother and God is our spouse. So, and God is our friend. So she she draws all of those, those images of love together, all those different ways of loving are brought together. And she meditates extensively on what it might mean for God to be our mother. She also calls Jesus our mother, which was drawn from a lot of ancient um, Christian literature. She didn't invent the idea that God is a mother. Uh, she definitely was drawing it from other sources, but she meditates extensively on it. Yeah, I remember uh, being confused by that and um, sort of worried about it at first. You know, <laughs> until I understood that this wasn't something new and that I wrote, I was telling, I, my book is all marked up. I, I mark up, I write in my books and they become my own, but they get messy. But anyway, I put um, motherhood is an attribute of Christ, which women share. Because sometimes people say, uh, like for a well-read mom, they say, well, what if you're not a mother? Can you still be in this? Well, of course, every woman has this this attribute that we share because we're in Christ. Right. Oh, I, it helped me understand that part. There's a, a wonderful theologian, Roberta Bondi, who I heard speak about Julian one time that, and I've never forgotten this image, but she even talks about the Christ um, in Julian as a mother giving birth to us on the cross. Mm -hmm. um, and th there's a fascinating moment, you know, where, um, where Jesus says, if I could have suffered more, I would have. Mm. And one of the ways I read that is, is as aspect of Jesus's mothering. Um, so this idea that if I could give you more of, if I could give you more of what I have, I would do it. I would give it to you. I would give it, I give it to all of creation. If I could do more, I would. And sometimes I feel like that. I don't know how other mothers feel or other women who are laboring in their communities and giving so much, but sometimes you feel like I can't give you any more, I'm giving you all I have. Right, right. You're, you're on empty. But still, I think as a mom, when you see a child sick or someone sick, everything in you, if you could give more, you would. You would, you would. Yeah. And that's what Jesus says to Julian, you know, when she says, how can you suffer like this? I, I can't, I can't bear the thought of you suffering. If I had known what your suffering would be like, I wouldn't have even asked to be a part of it. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. This is suffering that gives birth to life. Wow. And that's why I'm suffering. So it isn't, it isn't, she, he says, there's another kind of suffering. That's kind of suffering leads to hell. And it is, it is terrible. But this is not that. This is this is life giving suffering, and I feel like you know that's one thing as mother that, that mothering teaches you, right? No matter how you do it, is that there is a kind of struggle that does give birth to life. Mm. Yeah, all these images now as we enter into Holy Life or Holy Week, like new life in Christ, it, it takes on a new a new dimension for me. Um, so when you one of one of the things um, that Julian. I think can be helpful, helpful to us is in our prayer life. And she talks about uh, experiencing absence of God and that perhaps our absence is, is more due to our blindness. Can you speak to that? Yeah, she talks about, well, she, she has this whole experience where she feels deeply the presence of God and then she feels the absence of God. And then she feels the presence of God. 
And then she feels the absence of God. Presence, absence, presence, absence. She goes back and forth. She feels that God gives her the sense of presence. And then God withdraws that sense of presence and gives her the sense of absence, then gives her the sense of presence again and back and forth. And she feels that the reason why God does this action of giving her a sense of God's presence and then withdrawing it is to teach her that those are just feelings. God's truth, God's reality, God's, um, God's presence and work in our lives are far beyond our perception of presence or absence. And so sometimes God is present to us and that gives us a great feeling of joy and wellness and wholeness and whatever. And sometimes that God is absent from us and it gives us a sense of terror and fear and my gosh, what's gonna happen next? But her sense of it was, that's not what prayer's about. God is the ground of our being, she says. And God wants us to root, dwell, ground ourselves in that reality. Um, and it, it's not subject to our, our perception, our, our well and our woe, our absence and presence. But you know, a lot of us, um, more than we realize, we live by our feelings. Yeah. So now we're in these days when fear can grip us, um, anxiety can grip us, boredom is boredom. Yeah. We're going to our TV, the media constantly <laughs> to. But she doesn't recommend any of that, right? She didn't live in her anchorite cell that way. She lives wow. aware of the truth of who she was. So I think that would be interesting maybe to explore just a little bit. Like, what did she do all day long? And I mean, we also have to remember that this was a time of, she was doing two things which had been forbidden. She was teaching people spiritual truths as a woman. That was forbidden by the um, Bishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So she was doing that. And she was writing and writing in English about spiritual matters had also been banned. So if anybody knew that she was doing either of those two things, she would be dragged out of the anchorite cell and killed, burned. Wow. And it had happened. It happened to other women. Not that I don't think there were any anchorites who were burned. There were people being burned for writing in English, um, but they were dragged out of the anchorite cell and you know forced to go into some other kind of form of life because they were not trusted for breaking these rules. She was breaking both of those rules on a daily basis. So I think um, it is interesting to consider what fear might've been in her life. <laughs> you know, that she was living this kind of, walking on this tightrope. So she had slits in the anchorite cell, right? Can you tell about the cell and how she would have this yeah. with people? Well, so yeah, we can talk a little bit about our daily life too. There was a rule called the Anchorites rule that was that had been written for women who were enclosed, whether it was in their own homes or in the church. There were women who were choosing to kind of withdraw from everyday life and devote themselves to prayer. And there was a, a man who had written a book for them because it seemed like he may have been someone who had kind of a circle of women who counted on him as a, for a spiritual guidance. And so he wrote them a rule. And he so he recommends that they, you know, sort of get up every day and do what I would call yoga. <laughs> so get up every day and recite the Psalms while doing certain physical gestures that can only be good for you. You know, like um, the more I work in my desk, the more I understand what the anchor and rule was recommending that you get up, move around and while and doing so while recite prayers. Um, mm -hmm. So that was the morning. Um, and then there would be some, um, some time in there, which I imagine Julian used for writing. Um, and then in the afternoon, there was uh, an opportunity for people to come to the um, cell and ask their questions. And so every afternoon, she would sort of like open a curtain or keep a curtain closed, but come close to a window. And then people could talk to her about their struggles or their pain or their fear. And she would speak back to them and they, and she would do that for a couple of hours a day and then return to prayer in the evening and so on. So it was kind of this cycle of prayer and work and then attention to the outside world. So the Anchorite cell traditionally had three sort of areas. There was an area for a person who could bring you the necessities of life and empty your, um, what do they call this chamber pot and bring you food, pass you things through the window. Um, and then there was an outside kind of porch type thing where people could come in and ask questions. And then there was the cell itself where the anchorite lived. Um, and this could either be attached to the church or in the churchyard. So Julian. She, oh, good. She could attend the church. Um, That's an interesting question. So if she was attached to the church, then she could just peek through, they would have been like a 
a squint and she could have just peeked through it to be a part of the church service. Um, if she was in the churchyard, it could have been a little more complicated. Um, there were beggars, they called them beggars squints in the, in, so she may have left the cell, walked across the churchyard and looked through the beggars squint to participate in the, in the life of the church. Um, some people think that's anathema to imagine her leaving the cell to walk across the churchyard to look, um, look through the, the squint. But my impression of people in the Middle Ages is they were not very literalist. <laughs> so they, she could be enclosed and also leave the church cell and look through the, the beggar squint and participate in the life of the church that way um, without breaking the rules. You know, it, she was very deeply loved by her community. Mm -hmm. um, I think that part we do know from record that we have. So, you know, I think she participated as much as she could not, she wasn't physically present among them. They understood that she was separate and apart. Okay. Now you, you mentioned earlier something about suffering, that suffering can, you know, take us more into the life of God and, and bring something to birth or can lead to, um, there's another kind of suffering, right? That leads to, to hell. So can you distinguish those? Because... I tend to run, want to run from suffering and my fears, you know, it's a scary thing to suffer. Um, what would she say to that? Um, well, first of all, we have to clarify what hell was for her because it's really important because again, like the wrath of God, she asks to see sin and she asks to see hell and she sees nothing. And she goes on a long meditation about that, that sin is nothing and that hell is nothing. So for her, there isn't like the sort of concept of, of a place you go because you're bad. She, she is a pretty strong um, advocate that all are saved and that all are brought into the love of God, that, that, isn't, that God would not be content or, or happy to leave any of us out in the cold or out in suffering. So she, would, she, was, she did not believe that there was a place called hell where people went um, because they were bad or left outside of the love of God. She didn't see it that way. All are included. Love is love is for all. She so talks about, she talks about uh, hell though, doesn't she? In the end parts here? She asks to see it, but it, it does not appear. Mm. Okay, so go on about the suffering. Um, yeah, so I am um, seeing if you can find that part because it's just, a, it's a moment when Jesus is on the cross and is talking with her. Um, and she, um, she says, uh, you know, she says, I, I can't stand to see your suffering. And then he says, no, 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 you don't understand. So I think this is the kind of suffering that goes into the compost. Um, and maybe it's all suffering. You know, he doesn't say necessarily, this is the kind of suffering that is like this. Um, but we all know that there's a kind of suffering that feels so completely meaningless to us. It feels like it has no purpose whatsoever. You think of Ivan Karamazov in the brother, Brothers Karamazov, right? Saying that the suffering of one child is more than I can bear. And I cannot have you take that suffering into meaning and make meaning from it. Mm -hmm. um, so we all know that there's a kind of suffering that, that, if, if, that for us to make meaning from it is too much. Mm -hmm. We should not. We should let it be. Mm -hmm. um, what it is. I think also, you know, some of the famous theologians of, of the Holocaust who've said, you know, any words that cannot be spoken, that any words that cannot be spoken in the presence of a burning child, um, I'm not interested in, mm -hmm. right? Like, no, don't, don't bring me your theories about uh, how this all has meaning, because mm -hmm. if you would not say that if you were standing in the presence of a burning child. So mm -hmm. I think that we, so I think that Julian is trying to show some care there for this idea that there are kinds of suffering that we cannot, we do not know how to incorporate into our understandings or make things easy. And she's this, not about making things easy. This might be a good time for a question that Carrie Shaw is asking. Um, she says, what does Julian mean then when she says all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well when we know that suffering, pain and death are real and sometimes things are just not okay. I think that's a great question. And I'm not even sure Julian knew what she meant um, because she talks about this mysterious right making that belongs to God. So we don't, we don't get to participate in it. She calls it God's um, privy council. So if you remember that term from the Middle Ages, 
It's this idea that the king goes to the into the bathroom to have private counsel with his um, his people, a place where other people are not. She calls, so I think a little bit jokingly, I, I was, I'm amazed by Julian's sense of humor, but um, she calls this idea that all will be well and how God will make well of all of this, a deep mystery that belongs to God and is not, does not belong to us. And she, she sort of asks us to take it on faith um, for better or for worse. Uh, but she talks about this mysterious well-making that belongs to God and that she deeply believes in. So I don't know if that answers your question because it's certainly um, a really tricky and uh, complex question in terms of how is it that God does this well-making? Um, and she tries some of these domestic metaphors and some of these gardening metaphors for how well-making might take place. But I mean, I don't think it's extremely satisfying even to her, just she recognizes it as a function of God's own work. Yeah. Um, are there more questions, Rachel? Otherwise- um, I... No, that, that was the only one for now. Okay. Uh, Amy, uh, Thomas Merton had a love for Julian of Norwich. Are, are you familiar with that? A little bit, yeah, a little bit. Um, so anyway, I just, we, we read uh, Seven Story Mountain last year. So oh. it was just fun to see his love for her. Um, I think she's a deeply mature, you know, writer of the Christian faith. And so she's somebody that you can just go back to over and over again. And, and, and also she's giving us in her book, her own development. You know, mm -hmm. she shows us kind of how she moves through some of the stages of faith and of life. And I think um, that is a really um, a key part of um, reading her is kind of maturing along with her and, and seeing the places where she, she confesses to being feeling very weak, being, feeling very, um, you know, she says things like I'm a wretch in her early versions and then the wretch language disappears in the later versions, right? Mm -hmm. So I think she was struggling a little bit with how is it that I have been given these visions and how do I work with them? Um, but we see her development over time as she grows to increasingly trust in, in the love of God that she doesn't, she, she the, the wretch language disappears. So I think that's a fascinating aspect. For our, our reading club, we read the version by John Julian, uh, his translation. And when we, you and I first got on, you said you, you differ from him. Can you explain your differences in I love his translation. So I, um, I just want to say that, first of all, I think it's a great translation. I love, and it, it, I especially love it in, in this version called Love's Trinity. Um, and I love it in the Paraclete version, the, the Complete Julian. So I think his translation is very beautiful and, and really helpful in many, many ways. Um, but he, uh, around the same time that I was working on my biography, he also went to Norwich and he also did um, an exploration of, of Julian's life. Um, I came to the conclusion that Julian was probably um, of the merchant class, and I can go into endless lectures on why she was a part of the merchant class, but I'll, I'll spare you that, and if you want, write to me, and I'll, I'll tell you all about it, but I think um, she was a member of the merchant class. He concluded that she was a member of the noble class, and he felt that he had identified, and I don't know where he is on this today, but he felt that he had identified a noble woman whose name was Julian, who was probably a very good candidate for her to be um, Julian of Norwich, because we don't know who this woman was. Um, and I, I really disagree with that. I don't think that the, I don't think the dates line up. I don't think any of those things line up. And I don't think that it makes a lot of sense to think of Julian as a noble woman. I think she was a person who really understood the people. And I'm not saying that a noble person can't understand the people, but her understanding of the people is so organic that you just get the strong sense that she was with them. She knew them. She called them her even Christians, which is a, a strange um, phrasing for the people she's really connected with. Mm -hmm. Well, earlier you said that when you first discovered Julian and you went on that retreat day and you pulled this book off the shelf and started reading, that this book would be, or her writings would be life-changing for you. Can you tell us how they changed your life from, from that first moment till now, uh, a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, one of the things that happened on that retreat was I was reading through, as reading a, a version of Julian's work that I could, um, that was accessible to me 
um, later, as I wrestled with other versions of her work, I, I really struggled with this question of accessibility and, and really getting the depths of it. But I encountered that image of the hazelnut and I see that there's a question about the hazelnut. So this seems like a good time to draw those together. But there's this image in the beginning of, of Julian's book where she, she sees something in her hand that's the quantity of a hazelnut. And then um, she says, how can it exist? Because it is so small. It is so um, fragile. And she hears a voice say to her, it exists because of the love of God. And this image of the hazelnut becomes a kind of central image. It's another one of those domestic images. The hazelnut was a very, very powerful symbol in medieval Europe, but it was also a very intimate and ordinary thing. It, the hazelnut was, I mean, everybody had hazel hedges and hazel roofs and hazel, you know, hazelnut was an important point of uh, important source of nutrition. People ate hazelnuts to survive. So the hazelnut wasn't just a, a mystical symbol, it was also something of ordinary everyday life. But that question of how can it exist because it's so small and so fragile, that to me became a very deeply emotional question. It hit me in the gut and I sat in that retreat center and I just wept over the question of how it could survive and that it survives through the love of God it seemed overwhelming to me, but also in some way deeply, deeply true. And so I carried that home with me. Like I said, I was not a very religious person, but I carried this home with me. I stopped on my way home at the used bookstore. I picked up a version of Julian's uh, work at the used bookstore. I brought it home. And that evening I was doing dishes in my house. And I had this sense of like, I, I feel like I've been talking with a, a friend all day, but I, but I was alone. And I, to me, I had this mystical sense of connection, uh, like as if I had been pouring out my heart and my soul to someone and they had been speaking back to me. And I recognized that person in a sense as Julian. And it began this lifelong conversation with her um, where I would often say, I don't understand. This makes no sense. I can't, you know, how can, how can this be true? You know, you're kind of a, um, you're kind of a lightweight Julian. <laughs> I would say that, you know, I would say things like that. You're kind of a lightweight Julian. All will be well, all will be well. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, and then she would, you know, she would dialogue back with me, um, showing me, I think, as we went along deeper and deeper layers of how it is that she came to this understanding. Um, and, you know, and I think teasing me and laughing at me a little bit about like, you know, you want to see pain, you want to see suffering, you want to know what that's like you know, here's my life, here's how I lived. And yet I was able to understand and delight, receive uh -huh. God's delight of me through all of I me. Did. Yeah. And my physical being for me, that was really important because it's certainly a lifelong struggle. I think growing up as I did, I, I didn't often have a sense of the body as being deeply holy. I didn't have a sense of it being um, sacred. And so one of the things that Julian's work did for me was to help me to see um, the the unity, the oneing of the body and the spirit, which is is a really important part of her work. Um, Amy and Marcy, I found that passage that you were talking about earlier with Julian oh, okay. actually from this little book that Carmen Butcher did. Um, I can read it if I, I just find it really interesting. She says a person spends a whole day running errands and going here and there and doing this and that and the food in their body is shut in as if in a well-made purse. When the time comes for this person to go to the bathroom, the purse is opened and then shut again in the most decorous fashion. God does this for us. God comes down to us and meets our humblest needs. God never despises what he's made, no, nor does he turn his nose up at serving us in the simplest, most natural bodily functions for the love of the soul that he created in his own likeness. Nobody can know how much and how sweetly and how tenderly the creator loves us. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, mm -hmm. it gives you a real sense of the, the gritty everyday ordinariness of this mm -hmm. and combined with this, the sense there's another wanting, you know, yeah. the, the wanting yeah. of ordinary life, but divine life. Yeah, we have a, um, a couple of questions about specific translations and books about Julian, if you don't mind um, 
Someone's asking, did you read Julian's Gospel by Veronica Rolf or her Explorer's Guide to Julian? I have it on my shelf here and I've read it. I read it, it came out after my book came out. So I, um, it was unfortunately not available to me when I was reading everything I could possibly get my hands on about Julian. <laughs> but it did come out right after my book and um, I have read it, it's delightful. Um, another question from Stephanie Snyder. What translation of Julian's revelation of divine love do you recommend for the uninitiated in her writings? That's a great question. It, um, and Marcy, I know, has covered several. There are, there are, there are some really distinct and interesting uh, options for you. So this is the one that, that really overwhelmed me that day um, back in the retreat center. It's called Meditations with Julian of Norwich by Brendan Doyle. Um, and it has, for those, for, for me, as I was, I was somewhat blocked in my reading of Julian for a very long time, this, this translation helped me a lot because it's little, just, you can see on the page, like that's all I had to reckon with. And, um, and so it's kind of takes Julian's work and turns it into poetry. So I think that's an awesome place to start. I think John Julian's translation is wonderful. And in the complete Julian of Norwich, he gives you lots of notes and things. Mm. So I think that's wonderful. Um, there's a penguin, there's a penguin, penguin classics translation of Julian that has a wonderful warmth to it. Um, if I can just speak kind of like texturally about how Julian's been translated. I think there's a wonderful warmth in that penguin's classic. I cannot remember who the translator is right now. Um, and then there's this little, this is, I mean, this is not for the uninitiated. So this goes beyond your question, but I was totally in love with this book. I am totally in love with this book. It's called The Writings of Julian of Norwich. And it's a translation of the Middle English. Um, it's actually not a translation, I'm sorry. It is the Middle English mm. compiled by Nicholas Watson and Jacqueline Jenkins. And there would be times when I'd be reading Julian and I would think, oh, that must just be the translator just going off on things. She couldn't possibly have said that. And so this book really served as an anchor for me to go back and say, what did she actually say? And to find that often when I was dismissive of like, oh, she couldn't have possibly said that. No, in fact, she said that, but in a, in a language that the translator had tried to make a little bit more accessible to us. So I think it serves as a great anchor for me. So that's what I have. Amy, My how how was her work received? And she, she probably had to write it in hiding, do you think? Yeah, oh, absolutely, no question. And when was it found? And a great know, question. There are a lot of controversy. And I think she, I think she shared it mostly um, through the window. So um, at first, I think it probably just was through conversation. So she was doing the work, but she was sharing it verbally with people who came to her. Um, maybe she was reading it to them. Maybe she was just reciting it to them. We have to remember that paper and pen were rare commodities. So there's no way that she would sit and do what I do, which is like write sentences and cross them out and write them again and cross them out and write them. She would have had to compose her work in her mind mm -hmm. and then put it onto paper. And paper was, was expensive and it was not easily accessible. So she would have had to have people bringing her supplies. Um, she would have probably made her own ink, brewed it herself, that was very common. Um, one kind of interesting prejudice I ran into when I was researching Julian of Norwich was this idea that she couldn't possibly have written her own book because everybody did everything by, um, you know, hiring a scribe and, and reciting the book and then the scribe would write it down. And so people would tell me she couldn't possibly have written her own book. I really struggled with that. And so I did quite a lot of research and I found that Norwich has a wealth of historians really focusing on women's experience and on um, the women's experience in the 14th century. And what I learned from those historians is that women were writing all the time mm -hmm. um, because men were gone. And so women had, especially in the merchant class, women had to be writing all the time. They had to keep account books. They had to sign contracts in their husband's names. And then the other thing that they did that was kind of a popular fad among merchant class women was making their own prayer books. Mm. So they would write out prayers and then they would pull them together into books, put leather covers on them, do some basic book binding, and they would carry these with them to church. There's a wonderful book by Eamon Duffy who looks at all the marginalia and, and looks at all the books like this that we have. Mm. 
Um, and I loved, I loved learning about that. And it made me see that Julian could absolutely have written physically this, this book. Um, but she, that what's really radical about her is that she wrote down her own thoughts because these books were not, it wasn't radical for a woman to take a pen into her hand and write something, but it was radical for her to take her own thinking and translate that to the page. And so that I think is what's really radical about her, but I really do think she did it herself. So that's the first thing. Then the question is, how did it get out there in the world? Um, there were a group of people who were called, um, called themselves friends of God. They were working in many different areas of um, England and also across the channel um, in what's now the Netherlands and what's now Belgium and those areas. And they were deeply interconnected. Her book first shows up in a library of Carmelites um, in England, right before the Reformation. Then it disappears. So we have a few copies. We know there are a few copies in those libraries from like library um, compendiums, you know, things that like index of books available. So we know at some point she took the book, she passed it out the window and it ended up in this library. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was the Reformation and um, the King of England was burning books like mad because he wanted the metal clasps for the wars that he was fighting. Mm -hmm. And so he was burning books like crazy. And somebody took her book and snuck it over the English Channel into France. And it reappears in the 15th century in France among a group of people who were committed to praying with each other, a group of nuns. And they had a an, another male teacher and forgetting his name, but he brought the book to them. And together they, they read it, they copied it. And that's, those are, that's kind of where our first extant, extant copies come from. Wow. That's a really amazing story. We could have lost it. It's highly possible. Uh, can you, I, I wanna say one thing because I, Rachel, I have a question for you on, there's another book uh, coming out by Robert Waldron that is, I think it's called Lady at the Window. Can yes, that's right. Briefly about that, because for Well Read Mom, we used one of his writings on uh, Francis Thompson. Oh, fantastic. So we're familiar yeah. with him, right? It's a, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful little book, and it, it's called Lady at the Window. So I was interested in what you were saying, Amy, because the way um, it's, so it's an imagining of the final Holy Week in Julian's life right before she dies. And um it, it, of course, it's, it's fiction. The, the beginning of the book, <laughs> some people who read it thought, oh, this is real. Well, no, it's, it's, it's purely Robert's inspiration and imagining, but I think it is, it's, it lines up exactly with what you've been saying, where um, it, she has her cell, and through the one window, she interacts and has these conversations with people, you know, the young mother, the young man, the farmer, all these different people, and through the other window, she has access to the cathedral, and she has her writings, which she's hidden under her bed, just like you were saying how dangerous that was. And um, in, in his accounting of this week, he also does talk about that sense of absence, that sort of dark night of the soul that she experienced, um, and yet without losing faith and without using that real sense of conversation and God as mother. Um, so it's, it's, it's a brief read it would be a perfect thing to read this Holy Week, honestly, because we're, we literally be walking through these days with her. Um, so yeah, that's that's about to come out from Paraclete. It's, it's a beautiful little book, Lady at the Window. Thanks, Marcy. Oh, yeah. Now, it seems like all of us are going to be reading more of Julian because she yeah. has not lost her popularity. It's no, she's far more popular now than she was, you know, 15th century. I mean, she, her, she has this vision at some point that I find this really kind of miraculous, but she says at one point that she sees <coughs> that her work is going to go out in the world. She doesn't know how, <coughs> but she sees that it's going to happen. Hmm. And it did. And that's why we're reading it. And I, I'd like to commit some of her words to memory. Like I know you have, Amy. <coughs> Excuse me. What's your favorite quote? Just, just in bringing this <coughs> Uh, can you tell us your favorite quote by Julian? Well, that I did give you my three favorites. So I've given you my top three. So I'll give you my, my fourth. Okay. Um, 
Oh, I, you know what? I just opened the book and found finally the, um, the seeing and the blindness passage. <clears throat> so I'll read that. <clears throat> if I can get my voice back. Thus, I saw God and sought God. I had God and failed to have God. And this is and should be what life is all about as I see it. Okay, Amy, this is, is beautiful because I have my book open to that exact <laughs> reading. Ooh, so read the translation. From this translation by John Julian. And um, to me, I, I wrote in my margin um, that I, I receive and I thirst. I receive mm. and I thirst. But it, it reads this way. And thus I saw him and I sought him. And I possessed him and I lacked him. And this is and should be our ordinary behavior in this life as I see it. And it's like um, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. Right. Uh, yeah. we, we thirst. We're <laughs> filling, um, and, and both the thirst and the filling are holy. Hmm, right. And so anyway, I'm uh, just in closing, Amy, thank you so much for writing this book. I look forward to reading it. I hope readers uh, enjoy it. And it's been great to be here. Rachel, thanks for, thanks for asking uh, us to do this. It was great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been such a fantastic hour together and I'm sure answered questions and I'm sure brought up a lot more questions and piqued people's interest to read more Julian. So thank you so much, Amy and Marcy. That was fantastic. All right. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Right. Thank you to everyone who joined us. And we hope you enjoyed this talk as much as we did. Our prayers are with all of you for health and safety. And we hope you'll join us for more of these times together with our authors. Our calendar of Zoom events is available on our website, paracletepress.com. I hope you've seen the links in the chat about where you can find Amy's book and where you can find Marcy's book and more about the well read moms. So thank you again for joining us. God bless everyone. Take care. Thank you.